Minister of Justice. I call Mr. Peter Weir. Uh, question number one. <laughs> Principal Deputy Speaker, with permission, I will take questions 1, 9, 11 and 13 together, and I may require a little additional time to do so. On the 29th of January, I launched a consultation exercise aimed at seeking the views of the public on the closure of up to eight courthouses across Northern Ireland. The consultation has been launched against the backdrop of the Executive's programme for public sector reform and restructuring. In the context of a significant reduction in funding available to my department, it has been necessary to reduce budget allocations to all spending areas, including the Northern Ireland Courts and Tribunal Service. It is simply no longer sustainable to operate 20 courthouses in a place the size of Northern Ireland. In response, the service has established a modernisation programme aimed at ensuring the organisation is structured and resourced to provide an efficient and effective service that is affordable. The programme will involve a comprehensive review of current processes and practices with a view to designing an enhanced, integrated and affordable service delivery model. Nix is also seeking to rationalise the court estate in order to deliver efficiencies and to ensure that a reduced estate is used to its maximum potential. The recently published consultation document explains in detail how rationalisation could be achieved. Nix has strategically reviewed the current court estate in order to identify venues which could be closed with business transferred to an alternative court venue with minimal impact, thus ensuring continuing efficient and effective service delivery. The proposals seek to make greater use of the more modern or larger court buildings within the court estate. The transfer of business from Newtonards to Lagonside Courts, for example, will afford court users, including victims and witnesses, a better standard of facilities and accommodation. There is also a proposal for a dedicated family court centre in Belfast. In relation to impact and delays, there are no proposals to reduce the current numbers of scheduled sittings. Capacity will therefore be unchanged. In addition, the co-location of judges dealing with a particular type of business offers greater scope for the judges to work collaboratively and deal more effectively with the cases before them. Under the proposals, there would be a number of local government districts, including Mid and East Antrim, which will not have a court building. There is no requirement for each council area to have a courthouse nor is it the case that there is a courthouse within each of the existing local government districts. I look forward to receiving the views of the public and will consider them carefully following the closure of the consultation exercise. Mr Peter Weir for a supplement. Yeah, can, I ask the, um, yes, can I ask the Minister uh, how access to justice will be guaranteed given the fact that the Lord Chief Justice is against these proposals and particularly for the people of uh, Bangor, Newtonards and Hollywood where there will be approximately 150,000 people left without even a courthouse in the area. How can access to justice be maintained for those people in those circumstances? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, access to justice does not mean having a courthouse at the bottom of the street. It means having, a, it means having access to a working courthouse which has suitable facilities for the kind of uh, arrangements we now need, including, for example, facilities for witnesses, uh, for vulnerable victims, segregation from uh, defendants, all of those are issues which are easier provided in the more modern facilities. There will be no change to the numbers of court sittings. There will be significantly enhanced use of court buildings, so that instead of having a number of buildings with empty court rooms, there is a greater and more efficient use of, it, of the buildings which are in use. Mr Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answers. When Bangor uh, Courthouse closed in 2013, business was transferred to Newton Arge. The legal representatives in the area warned that it was not fit for purpose. Now, Bangor, or now Newton Arge is closing. What additional resources are you putting in place to serve the people of North Down and Arge? Or just 150,000 people? Is it just a matter of rough justice? Principal Deputy Speaker, the population of North Down and Ards, or Ards and North Down, whatever the district is to be called, is of, is of no relevance to the issue of the services provided. The, is, the issue is, are there, are there adequate courtrooms available to provide for the services which are required? And if members had actually read the consultation document, they would have seen that the plans are there to have in place the number of sittings in Lagonside and developing the dedicated family centre to ensure that the same number of sittings can be held, as would have been the case spread across a wider number of buildings, with the result there will be significant savings in costs 
at a time when the Department of Justice is under very significant pressure. To David McElveen. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I do thank the Minister for his answers so far. Does the Minister agree with me that to spend £1.7 million on Ballymena Courthouse in one year and then subject it to closure the next shows a Minister and a Department that is fiscally irresponsible? Yeah. Well, that simply isn't the case, Principal Deputy Speaker. There was a significant amount of money spent a few years ago uh, to comply with Disability uh, Discrimination Act to ensure that there was a roof which didn't leak. Given that Ballymena Court has a listed building, the DOJ has obligations to maintain the building, and that was carried through. But that doesn't mean that we can continue to use old, inefficient courthouses, which are half empty, when there are alternative facilities available in more modern buildings, in the case of Ballymena in Antrim and Coleraine, which will provide a better service for those who use courthouses, even if they have to travel 12 miles from Ballymena to Antrim to make use of them. To Robin Swan. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. Minister, not only must justice be done, it must be seen to be done. And I think one of the things about local courthouses is they can be covered by local newspapers so that the local population have the confidence that your justice system actually does work in some cases. Can the Minister give any reassurance as to how that will be facilitated? Principal, Deputy Speaker, I can see no reason why, in the case of Mr. Swan's constituency, a reporter from the Ballymena Guardian or Ballymena Times cannot travel to Antrim Courthouse and report what is happening there rather than sitting in Ballymena and reporting what is happening there. These are fundamental issues of vital reforms to ensure that the DOJ can live within budget. There is a very significant sum of money to be saved by making these reforms and the DOJ budget is unsustainable if we don't carry through these reforms. People need, instead of focusing on having a courthouse in every town, to focus on the facilities that are provided, the way in which victims and witnesses are treated in courthouses, particularly some of our older ones, while they may be, may be beautiful listed buildings, they're in many cases not providing the services which I believe our citizens need in the 21st century. Sean Lynch. I'll get the last can call you. And Minister, and one of those uh, courthouses again, I think we've done the rounds here, is Enniskillen. It may be old, but it's not inefficient. And the pro but, uh, they're proposing that they go to Dungannon, which is almost an hour's drive. This will hit the most vulnerable people, and it's the only courthouse in the county. And would you agree with me that it will uh, impact on the most vulnerable people? Well, I think Mr Lynch will find, if he reads the document, that the bulk of businesses intended to transfer from Inniskillen to Omer. Of course, there will be elements of impact in terms of people having to travel, and we're not denying that. But one issue which was followed through was to ensure that there was a reasonable travelling time, even by public transport, to an alternative <laughs> court venue, with the opportunity for people using public transport to arrive before court sat and to get home later in the day. The key issue has to be how we save the money that has to be saved whilst making use of the better facilities which exist in some courthouses, some of the more modern ones, and I accept there are particular issues on the, the age of the court estate in the west of the region, and how we deal with that to ensure that we make the maximum use of the facilities we have and don't spread resources so thinly that we cannot provide a decent service to those who are making use of them. Mr Dominic Bradley. Um, taking into account what has been said already by the uh, uh, Lord Chief Justice and the fact that millions of pounds have been spent on Armagh Courthouse, will the Minister not agree with me that it would demean the status of Armagh as a city to have its courthouse closed? No, Principal Deputy Speaker, I can't agree with such a suggestion. The reality is Armagh is no bigger than many another rural town which does not currently have a courthouse. I, I, I really do wonder what some members of this assembly think of their constituents, so that they think it's so necessary to have a courthouse, as if they're somehow suggesting there's a major crime wave in their area. The reality is there, there are significantly better facilities for those who would use courthouses in Craigavon and in Urie than there are in Armagh, and we must make use of the better facilities that we have. Stuart Dixon. 
Thank you, uh, President Deputy Speaker. Minister, would you agree with me that the type of measures which you are taking, similar to the measures which uh, your colleague, the Minister for Employment and Learning, mm -hmm. has proposed with regard to public finances, are the type of measures that all executive ministers need to be taking in order to meet the public service requirements that we have under this current budget? Well, yes. Principal Deputy Speaker, I understood that we had an agreement in the Executive for reform and restructuring and cutting out waste. It's easy for members to make special pleading for a building in their constituency, but I have the responsibility of managing the budget for the Department of Justice, which currently is unsustainable for the next financial year if we do not implement very sig significant measures for cost saving across a range of services. If we look at the, the consultation plan, and if members did actually read the full plan rather than merely looking at the concerns that they have about a building in their constituency, they would see that across the courts and tribunal service and the prisoner escort and custody service, we're talking about a saving potentially in excess of one and a half million pounds. That simply cannot be ignored in the face of the difficult budget which is set for the DOJ. So if members cannot come up with alternatives, if they cannot come up with something better than saying, my constituency is special, then they have not put forward any rational reason for doing anything other than what I am trying to do, totally in line with the executive's overall policy. The generalist. Why does the minister think he knows better than the Lord Chief Justice? And does the David Ford, does the David Ford who wants to close eight courthouses know better than the David Ford that spent four and a half million upgrading those same eight courthouses and the many of the eight courthouses has he ever even visited? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, I lost track of the number of questions there. The reality is I've already explained the issue about maintaining courthouses while they're in operation and that is an obligation to keep the buildings functional while they're there. So it's easy for Mr Allister to sneer about that. I couldn't tell you off, off the top of my head how many I've visited, but I've visited a significant number of courthouses but the reality is the Lord Chief Justice has certain responsibilities, and we certainly will listen to what the Lord Chief Justice has said. But the responsibility of the Courts and Tribunal Service is to manage the estate efficiently and to ensure that there are adequate sittings available for judges to hear cases. That is what is going on at the present time, and that is the detail we are looking at. But instead of the sort of sneering derisory comments from Mr Allister, I hope he and others will put forward serious suggestions as to how we address the budgetary difficulties, how we ensure we provide better facilities in more modern buildings for victims and witnesses, and how we ensure that the justice system works more speedily and more efficiently in the interests of something other than maintaining nice old buildings. Ronan McGarkin. Gurmi, a good question too. Principal Deputy Speaker, the proposals to reform legal aid and to close courthouses should not impact on the delivery of faster, fairer justice. I think I can say I've just explained the proposals to close courthouses. I've also set out my plans to reduce expenditure on legal aid on a number of occasions, with further significant reforms to be implemented shortly. The need to reform legal aid is evident and urgent as the demand continues to outstrip the available budget. Let me reiterate what I've told the House previously. The forecast expenditure on legal aid for 2015-16 is £103.6 million. Following the cuts imposed by the executive, the legal aid budget was reduced by 15% from £75 million to £64 million. This leaves a pressure of £40 million, more than the entire budget for the core department. I have made cuts elsewhere in my department to allocate a further £18.5 million to the legal aid budget, which still leaves a pressure of over £20 million. I am resolved to bring forward further measures to reduce the legal aid spend. I am introducing further cuts to Crown Court fees, saving some £7 million a year. I am bringing forward measures to reduce the spend on civil legal aid, which will realise savings in the region of £13 million per year. I am also considering measures to reduce the scope of legal aid, which will entail removing specific areas where the public purse has until now paid for representation. However, due to the life cycles of these cases, these savings will take some time to be fully realised. Therefore, in the absence of additional funding, I have proposed to the Executive the introduction of emergency legislation to impose a temporary levy of up to a maximum of 15% on all legal aid budgets, well, on all legal aid payments where the forecast exceeds the available budget. This is designed to be a temporary measure and will be strictly controlled, requiring Executive and Assembly approval. None of this affects the programme to deliver faster, fairer justice. For a supplementary. 
Okay, I thank the Minister for his response. Does the Minister not accept, with the, the closure of so many court or, courthouses, that this will result in a backlog and a loss of confidence in the criminal justice system? No, Principal Deputy Speaker, as I have explained, there is adequate accommodation in the 12 courthouses proposed to continue in operation to provide courtrooms for the sittings required, which are currently carried out over 20 courthouses. Therefore, there is no reason whatsoever to believe that this would slow up the programme. And indeed, by co-locating judges, as I said earlier, we have the opportunity to get better and more efficient management of lists and therefore potentially speed up justice. Pat Ramsey. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Could I ask the Minister following on from, from Bronman's question in terms of the legal aid question, specifically on family law cases? Does the Minister not accept that there will be a hugely detrimental effect on those cases, progressing them and developing them in court? Well, Mr. Ramsey certainly has a point about the issue of family cases, but I can't accept that there will be a huge effect on it. The reality is we are looking in detail about the way in which uh, cases are funded. The key issue around uh, matters of some family cases is that whilst the intention is to continue funding initial hearings, for example, in the case of a divorce or separation, there is no doubt that in some cases, people on modest earnings who therefore are ineligible for legal aid will find themselves subjected to repeated court cases by an ex-partner over things like the exact timing or duration of access to children because a partner who can get legal aid will continue to go back to court. That's not the kind of thing anybody funding themselves would do. It's not the kind of thing that we can afford to pay for on a continuous basis for the legal aid, from the Legal Aid Fund. It must be to get the decision right and then find better ways of arbitration or mediation rather than funding continual challenges where one party uses legal aid to damage the other party. Sir Tom Elliott. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, Will the Minister accept at least that there is a currently unacceptable delays of bringing cases to a conclusion? And if he does accept that, then how will he explain and how does he explain to this House that his actions are going to actually speed up those cases that are now being delayed? Well, Mr Elliott doesn't explain what kind of cases he's talking about have unacceptable delays. Certainly what I have seen across a variety of criminal cases in Crown Court, in Magistrates Court, in Youth Courts, is a speeding up in recent years. Not as much progress as we would have hoped at times, but certainly not delays getting worse. And I don't know how many times I need to repeat, the issue is not the number of buildings, the issue is the number of court sittings which take place to allow judges to hear cases, and there will be no reduction in the number of court sittings, even with the proposals to close a number of courthouses. So therefore, there is no issue of that adding to delay. Stephen Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, question number three. With permission, Principal Deputy Speaker, I'll answer questions three and seven together. Sorry, I was going to. The question of number seven has disappeared. Um, a large number of responses to the consultation have been received, including detailed submissions from the relevant medical professional bodies. Although the process of analysing these responses is not yet complete, and I do not want to preempt the outcome, it is my understanding at this stage that the main professional medical bodies have not raised any issue about the ability of clinicians to diagnose accurately fetal conditions which are lethal. A full assessment of the responses to the consultation will be reflected in the summary document, which I hope to publish as soon as possible. Signe for supplementary. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer and clarification of the issue. He will be aware of the statement made by Dr. Alistair MacDonald in the Inside Politics programme that uh, fatal fetal abnormality was difficult to predict and thereby um, may have given uh, to, to couples and women who have received this diagnosis a false hope um, that the diagnosis may be, may be inaccurate. Um, can, can he make it clear? that uh, Dr. Alistair MacDonald was wrong in what he stated and the politicians shouldn't uh, be so irresponsible in trying to protect their party position? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, I leave it to Dr. MacDonald to justify his stated political position. I can only go on the evidence which I have, for example, for the Royal College of Midwives, the Royal College of GPs, the Department of Fetal Medicine in the RVH, the Royal uh, College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists, the BMA, 
all of which, as I understand it, make clear their belief that it is possible to accurately diagnose fatal abnormalities of a foetus, which is of the sort which was proposed in the consultation, the two doctors certifying that there was a fatal abnormality that was incompatible with life and that no treatment could be offered after delivery which would make the situation any better. Those are the conditions which were being looked at. And it appears to me from, as I say, a preliminary look, and I'm not trying to prejudge the issue, but a preliminary look would suggest that those with most knowledge suggest that that is possible to be an accurate diagnosis. Paul Given. Speaker, does the Minister accept that his consultation document uh, departs from the long-established principles where the mother's life, both physical and mental, is the determining factor in providing choice in these circumstances, and that his uh, legislative approach would be creating an automatic entitlement to an abortion on the grounds of conditions that are incompatible with life, as subjective as that notion could be? Yes, Principal Deputy Speaker, just as a subjective assessment of the mother's long-term physical or mental health may be subjective and may also be objective, that is exactly the same ground as would be applied to determine in the context of fatal fetal abnormality the clinical judgment. Goldwyn McGuinness. Uh, thank you very much. I thank the Minister uh, for his answers. Uh, the obstetricians and gynaecologists uh, to my knowledge, have said that uh, in relation to option four, which the minister favours uh, in his consultation paper, they say that it's not clear or indeed precise and relies on an artificial and arbitrary line separating some difficult and sensitive cases. That uh, gives rise uh, to the uh, situation in which a proper diagnosis uh, cannot be made in all circumstances uh, and which I believe is uh, indicative of medical opinion in relation to this very difficult area and I would last ask the Minister to comment on that. Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, I would be in danger of actually prejudging the entire outcome of the consultation if I went too far on that. There may indeed be difficult cases. I think Mr Agnew's comment or question was, uh, was uh, brought about by a comment from Dr. McDonnell that, quote, the doctors always get it wrong. That I do not believe is the case. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, can the Minister clarify, um, just in the case of fetal abnormality, is there any set number of weeks when termination can be performed? Well, at the, at the moment, the answer is, is there, any, you know, to, is there any set number of weeks in which uh, termination can be performed is no, because termination on the ground of fatal fetal abnormality is not lawful within Northern Ireland at the present time. That is an issue which would have to be considered if there is a proposal to change the law as to exactly how it would apply. But members do need to be aware that in many cases the diagnosis, for example, in, in the anencephaly, the case which is most commonly cited, uh, doesn't tend to arise until the 20-week scan and therefore there are issues which would not relate easily to the normal termination time as the law applies in GB. To Raymond McCartney. I thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his answer to date. I mean, certainly we welcome this, this consultation, and as people bring their arguments to, to the table, they should bring it both on the basis of evidence and fact, but also, I would ask the Minister to should also consider a degree of compassion as well. Well, I certainly agree with Mr McCartney's point on that. I think it's easy to bandy statistics or opinions or whatever. The reality is the small area in which the consultation recommended change in the law was about dealing with traumatic, absolutely horrific situations in which a small number of women find themselves every year. And if we cannot deal with them with compassion, Whatever our, you know, our preferred outcome would be, we're not in a very good place as a legislature. Mr. Jimmy Spratt. Question for uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. The Northern Ireland Policing Board is an independent public body. The level of detail sought in outlining all payments to the chair, vice chair, and independent members is not retained by my department. The Policing Board's website contains a summary of all payments paid to both political and independent members over the previous five years, including expenses. The current annual remuneration rates 
Our chair, £58,606. Vice chair, £43,954. And independent members, £19,437. I propose to reduce these figures to 48,000, 24,000, and 12,000 in line with payments to members of other public bodies. Mr. Sprout for supplement. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister uh, for his answer. Uh, and given the uh, stringent budget cuts in relation to policing, will the uh, Minister also ensure that, in terms of the policing board that has already saw a dramatic cut in staff, that in fact further cuts will be made in the budget to that uh, body uh, in the future as well as the cuts that he has suggested uh, making to the independent members, the chair, vice chair, etc. Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, we do need to consider the role the policing board has to perform in terms of oversight for the PSNI and indeed the potential increase flowing from the Stormont House Agreement where they may well have uh, wider roles relating to some of the historical work and the fact that this Assembly has now uh, agreed that the National Crime Agency should have a role in the devolved sphere in Northern Ireland and the Board would have a role there. But I entirely take Mr Spratt's point that no part of the justice system can be exempt from the cuts which are needed as a result of the Executive's budget decisions. Mr Pat Sheehan. Three last concorda. Would the Minister agree with me that no steps should be taken by him that would undermine the effectiveness of the policing board to carry out its work uh, without fear or favour? Well, I certainly agree with Mr Sheehan on that point, and I don't believe that any steps have been taken by me or are contemplated to be taken by me. Uh, if he is hinting at the issue of a potential change in the way in which members of the policing board are appointed, I do not believe that if we were to move to a rolling appointment system and that decision has not yet been taken, that it would impinge on the independence and the responsibilities of the board. But that is an issue which is still under discussion within the department. Mr Roy Beggs. Principal Deputy Speaker, would the Minister agree with me that given the cuts that have been uh, highlighted coming for the police service and the effect that that will have on the ground, that the public will want to ensure that an appropriate level of funding is committed towards uh, administration and that they will want to see reductions in this area. But can, can he uh, uh, advise me whose call is it ultimately? Is it his call to set the figures? And how will he deal uh, with any uh, existing appointments that are, are there at present? Well, uh, I accept my responsibility as Minister to look at the rationalisation of remuneration for the policing board and indeed potentially for other bodies in line with the prevailing rates for similar bodies which exist in Northern Ireland. And I think, for example, if you compare the responsibilities of a chair of a health and social care trust, you might well find they're not much less onerous than those of the chair of the policing board or members, and yet the salaries are very significantly lower. So I think we need to ensure that we have a rational uh, way of determining what the appropriate remuneration is. I agree with, uh, with the point which Mr Beggs makes in general with very significant cuts being imposed on the DOJ, it is not possible to continue afford, to afford uh, very significant payments to those who serve on such boards. And given that the term of office of current members is up uh, in the early summer of this year, it will not impact at all on current members. Those who wish to uh, you know, be appointed to the, to the board when it's reconstituted will be fully aware of what the salaries will be. Mr John Dallet. Question number five. Substance misuse is a societal issue and one which is a significant factor in offending behaviour. For that reason, it is a problem inherited by and concentrated within the whole criminal justice system and not just in prisons. By the time someone enters the criminal justice system, it's very likely that a number of interventions, including in respect of education and health, will have been unsuccessful. There is a real and concerted effort by the Northern Ireland Prison Service to address substance misuse based around a three-strand approach to restrict supply to reduce demand and to assist recovery. In 2013, the prison service increased its focus on intelligence-led searching. The increase in drugs fines in all three prisons is clear evidence that this approach is targeting the right people and drugs in particular are being detected. NIPS has also established a team to address the recommendations from the recent Sijini Safety of Prisoners Inspection Report, 
working in partnership with the South Eastern Health and Social Care Trust, which has responsibility for providing health care in prisons. This includes an examination of the strategy to manage substance misuse in prisons. Order. That ends the period for topical questions. For listed questions, we now move to topical questions. And I call Mr Dominic Bradley. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, and can I ask the Minister uh, if he will tell the Assembly, given the disturbances in Row House last week, if he will tell the Assembly whether the independent assessment team led by Peter Bunting of the ICTU uh, has investigated and if he has any, received any report back from the team. Well, I thank Mr Bradley for the question, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, two slight quibbles. I, I'm not sure that the other three members of the, of, uh, the assessors uh, would necessarily agree that Peter Bunting is the leader of that. I think they regard themselves as four equals. But it's not specifically their job to inspect over specific incidents. There are other arrangements, including the, the role of the prisoner ombudsman for that, but it is certainly the role of the assessors collectively to make an assessment of the situation as it stands uh, within Row House at different times, and I will be meeting them shortly to discuss their current uh, view of the situation within Row House. Mr Bradley, for a supplement. Mr Deputy Speaker, thank you, and I thank the Minister for his answer. Um, can I ask the Minister if he will share uh, the report he receives back from the assessment team with the House? Well, uh, to talk about sharing reports suggests perhaps sometimes that they're somewhat more formal than some of the verbal reports which I receive or the Director General of the Prison Service receives. Certainly the, uh, the report which was published last year on the stock take of the, of the 2010 agreement was a clear example of openness in that respect. Much of the other work they do is done at a rather more informal level than that sense of publishing a report. Call Mr. Adrian McCullough. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Well, Mr. Can I ask you for an update on the recruitment process of the PCSPs? Uh, my understanding at the moment is that the Policing Board, Principal Deputy Speaker, is managing the appointment process for independent members of PCSPs. I believe councils will largely nominate members for the, the new PCSPs at the initial AGM, uh, which uh, in most cases will be held in March, I believe. <laughs> Uh, and the expectation is that independent members, when appointed by the Policing Board, will be in place by June of this year. Well, Mr McQuillan, first supplement. Thank the Minister for his answer there. Minister, given the pressure on the, the budgets and all we have heard earlier on, is this a talking shop? Is it something we can uh, look to that we can afford at this moment in time? Well, ironically, I was at a meeting in Coleraine Town Hall last night with Mr McQuillan's local PCSP, what I certainly see when I visit PCSPs, maybe I only visit the best ones, is good work being done in a number of areas, work around a variety of topics, around uh, addressing crime, the fear of crime and antisocial behaviour, good work being done um, in some cases with diversionary work for young people, uh, or work being done to provide reassurance to older and vulnerable people, work being done around issues like rural crime of trailer marking and trackers, all of that is work which is being done because local partnerships have identified the needs for their immediate area. So whilst there may certainly be cases that not all PCSPs are as efficient as they might be, there is no doubt that some extremely good work is being done, and what we're trying to do is spread the message of that good work to all of them. Mr Jim Allister. Thank you. Um, can I ask the Minister, why is there such a disparity in um, anticipated funding in the Stormont Castle Agreement in respect of the legacy inquest cases where some £19 million a year is being sought, in contrast to the uh, HET cases within the HIU, where only a third of that figure is thought necessary to investigate hundreds of cases? Why does that disparity exist? 
Well, I'm not quite sure what the, um, the point Mr. Allister is trying to make, Principal Deputy Speaker, because if he's saying that the funding which is proposed for the HIU is significantly greater than the funding currently going into the HET, that's entirely correct. Um, indeed, the, uh, the Stormont House Agreement uh, did not see the government providing all the additional funding that was thought necessary, and detailed work is continued to be done as to exactly how that will be managed as we look at the HIU establishment. Mr. Allister, for a supplement. Well, just to make it clear, the Stormont Castle Agreement anticipated a budget of $19 million for legacy inquest cases. The question is, why was that such an inflated figure in comparison with the figure required to investigate the hundred of overhanging HET cases? Is there a hierarchy of victims in respect of this matter? Because certainly from funding, it very much looks like it. Well, I think the figures that Mr. Allister is quoting from, and I've got the Storm and Castle Agreement in front of me, was the current issue of the costs of funding those elements which will go into the Historic Inquiries Unit. And he's quite correct that the current estimate of costing for legacy inquests is significantly greater than that for HET cases. But of course, he does need to acknowledge the fact that um, when we get into legacy inquests, we do tend to involve a large number of lawyers, uh, many of whom will be being funded by the state, um, as opposed to the work uh, being done by the HET, which is largely being funded by people on the equivalent of police officers' salaries. I call Ms. Rosalind McCorley. Thank you, Mr. Principal. Deputy Speaker, uh, the Minister told us earlier that he is planning to introduce legislation to impose a temporary levy of up to 15 per cent on legal aid payments. Can I ask the Minister how long is temporary likely to be, and is there a danger that this could become permanent? Well, I can assure Ms. McCauley it's not my intention that that would be the case. Um, the intention, of course, subject to executive and assembly approval, is that emergency legislation would provide for a levy of up to 15 per cent on bills at the point of payment. The maximum levy to be set in any one year on the basis of the difference between the estimated expenditure and the budget allocated for it, allocated on a year-by-year -year basis with assembly approval on a year-by-year -year basis, and the primary legislation, the current intention from the DOJ would be they would have a sunset clause at the end of the next assembly mandate in 2021, stressing the point that the, the maximum deduction would be 15 per cent. If the calculated deduction would be less than 5 per cent, it wouldn't apply at all. And the expectation is that as reforms bed in to ensure that the legal aid system is managed more efficiently and more effectively, that the, uh, the reduction would reduce over the course of that time. Corley for supplementary. Thank the Minister for his answer. But would the Minister um, accept that perhaps not enough uh, consideration has been given to the implications on most vulnerable, particularly um, in, in thinking of family courts? Well, I did answer something at that point from a, a colleague earlier on, Principal Deputy Speaker. The, uh, the expectation is that the cuts would apply evenly across all bills because there's no other way of doing it. But at the same time, we would be looking at instituting the wider reforms when I highlighted earlier the issue of private family law proceedings where one partner or one ex-partner can make life extremely difficult uh, for another uh, by continually going back to court over minor issues of precise time or duration of access to children, for example. It is certainly the case, as put to me by a number of MLAs, that that is frequently carried out by a partner on or an ex-partner on legal aid against an ex-partner who doesn't qualify for it. Those are the kind of issues we have to address, but the important thing would be to maintain the basic provision of legal aid for the key hearing and then ensure that there are better ways of mediating uh, to deal with those, those sort of issues which frankly should not have a court hearing to determine whether access is half an hour earlier or later. Mr. Martin O'Meara. Could I ask the, the Minister, in relation to racist attacks in South Belfast over the last year in particular, and without moving the Minister into policing matters, can he give us a, a, an assurance to the House that the police have the resources and the will to bring to book those who are responsible for those racist attacks 
uh, and for which thus far there have been no convictions. Well, certainly, Mr. Moyle raises a, a serious issue which uh, features in, you know, in a number of causes for discussion as he highlights the, the specific issue of dealing with an attack is an issue for the police and an operational matter, and I shall definitely not stray onto the Chief Constable's territory there. What we do see is good work being done. I mean, for example, the, the District Policing Compu uh, Community Safety Partnership in South Belfast recently ran an ending hate crime event. There is work being done training people in a variety of different areas around how we deal with that. The DOJ has responsibilities with the hate crime multi-agency group. Uh, we part fund, fund the, um, the practical action scheme for deal with, dealing with the effects of hate crime, but the important issue is to stop it happening, and that involves the partnership working, and it also involves, frankly, political leadership being given in every quarter to ensure that people stand up collectively against those who would seek uh, to engage in hate crime of any kind, and of course, we should also acknowledge that there was an incident at St. Anthony's Church in Willowfield uh, last night, which presumably was not racist hate crime, but was sectarian hate crime, and it seems to be just another side of the same coin. For supplementary. My last concordia was when we had the election era. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister. Um, I, I want to, uh, as I ask my supplementary, I, I think it's important to pay tribute to. Uh, Anna Lowe, your representative in South Belfast, who has been the, borne the brunt of many of these racist attacks. But in terms of language and leadership from all of us in, uh, in this House and in positions of civic leadership and of leadership in society, uh, can you assure the House that your department that you will stand four square behind those who give the type of leadership that a multicultural society uh, de de desires and demands? Well, I thank Mr Mulya for his tribute to Anna Lowe, although I suppose the reality is we should not be asking Anna Lowe or others from ethnic minorities to be standing up against racist hate crime. We should be asking those from the majority community to stand up against such hate crime. Certainly the, D I mean, the DOJ will continue to do the work because, for example, the community safety strategy includes elements which relate to hate crime and the, the wider issues of, you know, of partnership, particularly through PCSPs, through a variety of other issues through seeing the agencies working better to tackle the reasons why you know, hate crime appears to rise. All of those are issues which need elements of research, need elements of partnership working, and need a united single voice from this community that hate crime will not be tolerated and that this House and the wider community will show the leadership it should show against such crimes. Mr Chris Little. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I uh, join the Minister in condemning the attack on St Anthony's in East Belfast and indeed the Memorial Garden uh, at Pitt Park in East Belfast this week as well. And welcome his commitment to supporting the fight against that type of hate crime in our community. Can I ask the Minister what impact he thinks the extension of the National Crime Agency uh, to Northern Ireland will have on the ability to tackle this heinous crime in our community? Well, uh, my colleague raises an interesting point. I'm not sure that the National Crime Agency will be the key agency for dealing with issues like hate crime, but there's no doubt that some of that comes in alongside those who are engaging in a variety of organized crime, who are seeking um, to use uh, threats and intimidation, uh, in many cases principally against those who are perceived from minorities, to make life easier to carry out uh, their fairly obnoxious operations, and there's no doubt that having the National Crime Agency in place will help deal with those organised criminals, although the frontline issue of dealing with hate crime will naturally fall to the PSNI. Human but it is well, human trafficking. Well, <laughs> and, and, and human trafficking, which seems to be just added into it. Um, I mean, human trafficking is clearly an issue, whether it's an, a matter of international reach, whether it's a matter of the national intelligence and reach well, we cannot expect the PSNI to, you know, to fully solve on its own. We, we saw, for example, in the, the BBC radio documentary at the weekend, uh, it would have been pretty difficult for the PSNI to have somebody reading the Chinese language press in London to identify that people were being trafficked for the sex trade. There are other issues where there are clearly people who are producing organised gangs into forced labour, principally from Central and Eastern Europe. All of those are issues where the National Crime Agencies uh, organisational reach and intelligence will be a major boost to the PSNI. Order. Time is up.
That concludes our question time.